I wanted to do a series of videos on an article called Beyond the Clash of Civilizations. And this was an article that was written by uh, Azim Nanji, who, is, uh, who at that time was with the Institute for Smiley Studies. And basically, this article is about um, this notion of a class of civilizations. And this notion actually is due to a man by the name of uh, Samuel Huntington. Uh, Samuel Huntington. And basically, um, Huntington, back in 1993, introduced this nomenclature of a clash, a clash of civilizations. Okay, and he actually subsequently wrote a book in 1996 uh, that was called "The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of the World Order," which was published by Simon and Schuster. Uh, and basically, what Huntington was trying to do was predict what uh, global relations would be like in a post in a post-Cold War society. And he was really trying to predict uh, you know, what was going to be happening after the Cold War. And really the central thesis of his argument was that there would be this type of, of conflict between, um, between civilizations. It would, it would be basically a cultural, a cultural conflict versus an ideological conflict. Okay, so it was cultural versus ideological. And basically, Huntington defined or really identified uh, what, what he called civilizational clusters. Civilizational clusters. Let me write that down. Uh, and basically, civilizational clusters were, were, as you can imagine, clusters of uh, civilizations. And he identified a number of these different clusters. And the three more prominent ones that he, he noted were the Asian uh, civilizational cluster, which basically referred to uh, areas like like China and, and Japan and, um, and East Asia. He also identified what he called the Western, the Western uh, civilizational cluster, which, as you can imagine, included places like North America, and it also included places uh, like Western Europe as well. Uh, and then he identified a third civilizational cluster as the Islamic world, the Islamic world. Okay, and basically, um, when, when he used this term "clash of civilizations," Huntington basically referred to potential global conflicts that would arise in a post-Cold War world, world uh, and, and that is really in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, his analysis was meant to guide foreign policy perspectives, not just of uh, individual analysts, but really of, of broader governments. So it was a much more broad scope. And what Naji basically does is he looks back on Huntington's ideas a decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where we've had the benefit of, of time and perspective, and he contends that we really haven't had large-scale clashes between civilizations, but rather uh, we've had uh, clashes among smaller groups or factions within these civilizations. And he really critiques, Nanji really critiques the focus on this word, quote-unquote, civilization especially in the context of the Muslim world, uh, since civilizations are not necessarily, and he quotes, quote, monolithic, unidimensional, homogenous, or static entities that can be essentialized, unquote. Uh, and instead, I think civilizations are really, can be quite heterogeneous and, and diverse, especially in the context of the Muslim world. And then Naji ultimately advocates in the article that uh, you know, dialogue can be a means to protect and, and really promote the diversity of civilizations, and, and as he says, to quote, better understand our shared contributions to humanity's cultural heritage, unquote. All right. And he notes in the article, there's been a significant, a significant um, Muslim presence in, in many countries, aside from the ones you traditionally think of. For example, if you look at uh, Europe, especially areas of, of Western Europe, like France and, and Germany and, and Britain and other areas, uh, there are literally uh, several million Muslims who live in these regions. And aside from that, you also have many, many millions of Muslims who are living in, in the Eastern European areas, like areas like the Russian Federation and, and the Balkans and, and uh, Bosnia and Kosovo and Macedonia and, and other places in, in, this, uh, in this part of the world right here. Okay, and then aside from that, you also have uh, in, the, in Canada and in the United States, there are approximately... Uh, six million or so Muslims, six million Muslims who live uh, in these regions. And so Nanji says, quote, we cannot any longer have a monolithic notion of Western civilization and culture 
if it ever was, primarily because of its own internal diversity, unquote. And then ultimately, if you think about it, the interactions between Islam and the West are, they really are, um, they're not new, they, they're far from new, they've been around for, for, for many, many, many centuries. And you know, these interactions not only have religious underpinnings, but they also have intellectual and cultural and political and, and military underpinnings. Now, ultimately, Islam, you know, for those of you who don't know, Islam is an Abrahamic faith. I mean, it could be, um, you know, Islam recognizes um, Abraham, certainly, but not only recognizes Abraham, it recognizes many of Abraham's religious successors. For example, uh, Moses and, uh, and Jesus, um, and ultimately culminating in the Muslim view with Muhammad. But really, these prophets were... You know, they're thought of um, as, as part of a continuum. They're not, they're, there's no conflict in terms of, of the message of, of these prophets. It, it's Again, Islam is inherently an Abrahamic faith. Okay, and, and this continuum, it's not just superficial or nominal, but really is, is fundamentally rooted in Islam. And for example, uh, Muslims commemorate the sacrifice made by Abraham of his son. And this is a story that's both in the Quran and in the Bible. And you know, this, this sacrifice is commemorated as part of a very important festival at the end of the Muslim pilgrimage. So it's it's not something that's kind of taken lightly uh, in the Islamic faith. And, and as Nanji writes, quote, Muslims believe that God had revealed himself to every human society, and in that experience, God revealed himself to many of the significant figures that are part of biblical history. So in general, you know, Islam obviously has its roots in, in areas like the Near and Middle East uh, around here, uh, but then subsequently spread uh, in many directions. It spread certainly towards Central Asia and to, to South Asia as well, and uh, to Southeast Asia. Uh, and also, um, on the other hand, also spread to Africa too. So it, it you know, did really play, it, it did really expand at, shortly after its founding. And, and Muslims really played in many ways according to Nanji and really according to the historical record, played a very important role in the bridging of earlier scholastic knowledge. Uh, and as Nanji writes, quote, the entire philosophical heritage, the legacy of Aristotle, Plato, the great Greek philosophers, physicians, and scientists, was translated into Arabic in the 9th century at a place called Beit al-Hikmah. Let me write that down. And actually, I should write down the names of some of these scholars because it is very relevant. I think people forget that this, this actually happened. But works of, of folks like Aristotle, um, Aristotle and Plato, they actually were translated, translated from the original Greek, for example, into Arabic. Okay, and this actually happened uh, in the ninth century. Okay, and the translations uh, were done at a place um, in Baghdad uh, known as the Beit al Hikmah. Beit al which, as I mentioned, is located in uh, in Baghdad. Okay, and interestingly enough, it was these translations from Arabic that were then made available subsequently to the West uh, in the form of a Latin translation that was based on the Arabic as opposed to the original Greek. Okay, and I think people have have forgotten this important role that the Islamic world played in being able to translate these works and subsequently allowing them to become accessible to the West. And in general, Muslims do believe in the learning and the development of the intellect, and they have played a crucial, but I think often forgotten role in the dissemination of knowledge. So I hope you like this video. I will continue making more videos on Azim Nanji's paper, Beyond a Clash of Civilizations.